you. Thank you, uh, Donna Mona and Rodet, for the invitation and for you staying till the bitter end. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two uh, different uh, projects uh, dealing with modularity. This is a topic that I've been obsessed with for a while now. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about the older project just uh, because it has a network context and uh, spend more time on, on the other that deals with three-way data. So the first project is uh, uh, dealing with integration of two biological networks. This is the work of Didi Amar, was a PhD student in my group and is actually now a postdoc here at the Simons. So uh, we are looking for uh, combining two types of networks that share the same nodes but have different semantics for the edges. So uh, the same vertex set for H and G, and we want to summarize this information from the two network in something that we coin a module map. And uh, the module map has nodes that are modules, namely sets of uh, genes from the vertex sets or vertex subsets. And we want these uh, modules to correspond to highly connected uh, sets in the first network, in H. On the other hand, the links in the module maps are connections between two modules that are highly, highly interconnected in the other graph, in G. So here is an example. So uh, the, re the black edges are in H and the blue edges are in G. And uh, we are looking for modules like these three guys that are highly interconnected in H. So think of them as clusters in H. And uh, they should be connected by links which are highly interconnected sets in uh, the blue graph, in G. And we want this, uh, we want to avoid a singleton like this, namely clusters in the first uh, graph in H, which are not connected to anything in the second. Now the rationale of uh, this uh, problem, the source of this formulation comes from uh, work that we and others have done on uh, combining uh, genetic interactions and uh, protein interactions. So the simplest case, just look at two modules. So you're looking for two sets, each of them rich with protein-protein interactions. And between them, the connections are rich with genetic interaction. And the rationale would be that uh, perhaps we have two pathways or two clusters, and each of them can be a backup to the other. However, if you hit one gene in A and another in B, then uh, you, get, uh, uh, you get the epistatic effect, and uh, therefore you see a lot of genetic interactions in between and a lot of uh, protein interactions within. And when we analyze this uh, by looking just as pairs like this, we realize that sometimes we are missing information and we want to do this globally. So thus doing, doing it one pair at a time, we miss some of the information. So this is a formulation that, uh, uh, so, so this is what will be the module map in this. So a node corresponds to a dense black subgraph and a link corresponds to dense interconnections in the blue subgraphs between them. And as I said, this is a, a generalization of both clustering, the generation of the black sets, and by clustering the interconnected pairs. So I won't get into the algorithmic details. We tried 
about 10 different combinations of variants and we came up with what we call a ModMap algorithm. So we get, it starts by uh, building a basic an initial solution using a maximal by-click enumeration and then uh, does global refinement based on a probabilistic score. So maybe this is the main contribution here because algorithmically we've been using tools uh, and ideas that have been around, but uh, how to compute efficiently a probabilistic score that will give a single score for the whole subnetwork that we have now is, is uh, been a, a challenge. And we really, uh, we successfully applied it both to yeast uh, PPI and GI data, yeast PPI and specific DNA damage response uh, genetic interactions. Here, of course, the network would be much smaller because there will be fewer uh, DDR specifics. And on completely different note, we also applied it to lung cancer data where we had the gene expression of patients and one network age corresponding to co-expression and the, uh, the other network corresponding, corresponded to differential co-expression between the cases and the controls. And they are indeed uh, revealing uh, combinations of modules that you find by looking at these two together. So let me now uh, move to the second project. Uh, and this is about three-way data. I'll talk a bit in more detail about it. So this was led by Didi Amar again, and in collaboration with Dania Kutielli, a statistician at Tel Aviv, uh, Adi Moron Katz, another uh, PhD student in my group, and Talma Hedler, uh, who is a brain researcher uh, at uh, the Ichilov Hospital. Uh, and here is the outline. Uh, let me just move ahead. So again, we are talking about modules. So another way to think about modules, suppose we have this matrix, and clustering is just, a, a cluster would be just a set of rows that behave similarly across all columns. And a by cluster would be a subset of the rows and a subset of the columns that will uh, have some show some coherent behavior. And of course, by clusters are more flexible; they could overlap, uh, and the, the search space is much richer. Uh, but we are we have been talk, thinking about three-way data. So in addition, so think about having uh, multiple time points. Or if you wish, uh, each matrix would be uh, maybe genes times uh, time points, and you would have uh, multiple matrices for multiple subjects, and you want to find some kind of uh, modules that are common to some or to all of them. So we have a matrix for each subject, and the rows could be, uh, would be the measured object. So genes would be a natural possibility here, and the column would be the time points, and what would we would measure would be gene expression. So this is one application. Another application which actually motivated this uh, work to begin with was uh, MRI data. So uh, in MRI data, uh, what we have is uh, measurements of uh, the amount of activity in the brain in uh, voxels, which are cubes of one millimeter on each uh, dimension. So you get about 100,000 of those in each measurement. And every three seconds, you get such a measurement. So you get about 100 time points. So you have a matrix of 100,000 times about 100 for each patient. And if you want to uh, somehow reduce the dimension, rather than dealing with voxels, you can deal with parcels, which are contiguous brain regions that are believed to have some uh, biological function. So you could reduce the number of uh, the, uh, the number of rows from 100,000 to maybe 1,000. Okay, 
And the, and the data that Adi was studying was uh, behavior of the brain at rest. So it turns out that uh, uh, when our mind is resting, as far as one could rest in an fMRI machine, which is pinging like hell, uh, when the mind is resting, uh, there are certain uh, networks in the brain that wake up and start to work. So we don't have a full understanding of what it is, but think about it like garbage, garbage collection. So, you know, when you don't have any other task, the brain is doing some maintenance. And uh, the point is that these subnetworks uh, arise and uh, uh, are show activity, but of course, when you summarize the information across multiple subjects, uh, there will be total complete uh, uh, asynchrony between the networks in sub different subjects. And also this uh, activity does not go along the 100 time points that we measure. It will show up at a certain interval and maybe disappear and show up again. So we are looking, we want to cluster this data. We, don't, we want to do some dimension reduction that will give us a meaningful result, but we have to be very flexible about the modeling. We cannot do like a three-dimensional subcube of the, uh, of the huge cube that we have and hope that with rigid dimension we will get a meaningful result. So uh, if we had just a two-dimensional case, we are looking for something like a bi-cluster. And uh, this is a well-studied problem that many, including us, uh, worked on it in the past. Uh, but uh, what about consistency uh, across multiple subjects? So now we have multiple matrices like this, and maybe not all of them show the effect. So out of the five, maybe three have uh, some coherent behavior. And also this behavior, as I explained, may not be uh, on the same time point for each one. So the time point could change from one subject to another, and the gene set, the subset of the rows that we want to analyze should have some common core, but uh, we cannot assume that exactly the, the same set of rows will be uh, involved in each subject because maybe some are irrelevant and maybe there is some subject-specific part uh, that we should account for. So this was our thinking, and uh, the, this uh, brings up this kind of uh, way to visualize the problem. So here we chose the set of subjects, and there is this common part denoted here by A, which is the set of genes. Some of the subjects may miss some of those, and the sub each subject could have also a private part to the same uh, module. Okay, so uh, what constitutes a model in this three-way data? We have a subset of the subjects, a subset of the rows corresponding to this A part, and the subset of time points for each subject, and additional uh, subject-specific part, which is a subset of the core row module. So most of the rows will be common, but maybe not all, and additional Say subject specific uh, part. So, additional, these dark uh, uh, blue uh, rows are subject specific. So, how shall we, uh, what shall be looking for? We want modules with, which are unusual compared to the background. So, either unusually high or unusually low values. So assume the simplest thing that one can assume that there are two distributions, one for the values in the background and one in the values within the modules. So the white part will have one distribution, F0, and the blue parts will have a different distribution, F1. And if the data is binary, then just think about probability of one being higher in the blue part than in the white part. And if we're talking about real value data, just assume that we have two 
normal distributions and the values for the blue part will be will have a higher mean uh, so these are the simplest assumptions one could make for binary and real value data so uh, we represent this model uh, in, a, in a graphical model uh, so in our toy example we had to choose the subject so one part and then the core rows so uh, we need to we will have a variable corresponding to the relevant each relevant subject and a variable corresponding to each row for the core module that we choose and once we have chosen the set of subject uh, we combine the information on the core uh, module rows and the relevant subject into uh, a node that will also represent the subject specific uh, information and uh, another variable will take care of the time points that as I said will be uh, subject uh, specific uh, so on this level we have the global information the subset of the subject and the core rows and on this level we have the subject specific information and what ties this module together is the fact that this is governed by, uh, by these global variables so uh, we, need, we compute a posterior uh, based on, on this model so since it's a, a Bayesian network we can just uh, uh, multiply the conditional probability so this corresponds to the hyperparameters of the problem uh, this corresponds to the core row and the relevancy of each uh, subject this part corresponds to uh, the subject rows uh, that depends on t these two variables uh, for the time points the, uh, for the uh, data that we used we applied some Markovian assumption because we assume that we don't just get an independent set of time points for each patient but there is some contiguity not complete but partial contiguity uh, between uh, the model the, the columns and eventually we compute the likelihood of the data which is simply uh, we multiply across all uh, all uh, square all, all uh, q subcubes in our matrix where we either pick up the uh, background probability or we pick the model probability depending on uh, whether this point depend uh, belongs to the one of the module so uh, uh, i didn't describe the hyperparameters but we made the simplest possible assumption so we were using uh, Bernoulli or normal for F0 and F1 and we use the beta variables uh, or a simple Markov model for the rest so the algorithm uh, we call it twigs for three-way model inference via Gibbs sampling so the initial solution is generated using a bi-clustering solution we tried both bimax which is a good, very good enumerative solution for discrete uh, values for, for binary values and the ISA from the Mabarkaiz group that works well on uh, continuous data and the improvement is done via Gibbs sampling so we apply a Gibbs sampler namely each time we uh, fix the values of all the variables and uh, we compute the posterior based on that single variable and improve and we do this cyclically uh, of course the technical part here is uh, deriving all the conditionals and I will skip it here uh, eventually we end up at a local optimum uh, surprisingly it worked very fast so we needed less uh, about 50 iterations and uh, what we do at the end is you get a value on each iteration for each of your variables and we just average over them and this algorithm just finds a single module how do we deal with uh, finding multiple modules one possibility is to st start from ISA or BIMAX by getting a 
complete solution, namely a set of bi clusters, and then run Gibbs on each one separately. You get a set of modules, and you do some uh, filtering to remove redundancies. An alternative, which is even more uh, embarrassingly simpler, is just to pick up the best from ISA or, uh, or uh, BIMAX, uh, run Gibbs on it, uh, and get a module, and then just mask over the entries in the, in the cube that uh, were obtained, uh, that belong to M. Uh, so this is uh, similar to the classical uh, church algorithm that was the very first attempt to do by clustering. It's, I think, around 2000. And this is repeated several times. So we did some testing on simulated data. So uh, 500 rows, uh, 50 time points, uh, 10 subjects, and we planted 50 core modules of about size uh, 20 uh, uh, rows each. These are the noise probabilities, and this is a probability of adding private row for each row separately. Uh, and uh, the, here you see the results for binary data and for normal data. Th these are the, the noise parameter for noise in the data. So we applied BIMAX ISA separately, added also uh, by, uh, Gibbs uh, and the masker to Bimax and the other combination. It turns out that the best combination that is consistently uh, the leading one here is Bimax plus Gibbs plus uh, the masker, and we call this version twigs, and this is what we used from uh, uh, from now on. Interestingly, even if there is no subject-specific information, uh, so if this P0 value is zero, uh, we still see an advantage over the pure by clustering solution. So here is one application. This is, uh, has to do with uh, sepsis uh, data. So uh, the, we had uh, measurements of on uh, expression for uh, 14 subjects, and they were measured uh, on five uh, time points, zero time and four additional each. And uh, we did the simplest thing possible. We just binarized the matrix and uh, comparing to time zero and taking the fold chains and ended up with some 6,000 genes. And when we applied twigs, we got uh, two core modules. Uh, so module one contained 11 subjects and 53 core genes. And when we tested for enrichment, it was enrichment for enriched for response to bacteria, which is makes sense. And the second module was smaller, but similar number of genes. And it was enriched with T cell activity. So again, a result that makes sense. And when we zoomed in and we wanted to look at the private part of each uh, of each subject, so the 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 red uh, uh, the red bars indicate the subjects, and each one has four time points. So uh, and the red ones are those that are belong to uh, the module. So you see that they are different between the subjects. So some contain all the four time points, others contain fewer. And in green, you see the enrichments on the private part of the module in each subject. So for example, this subject 24, uh, his g private genes were enriched with cytokine-mediated signaling pathway, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you see that typically the, there are not many enrichment, but there were two subjects that had a substantial number of enrichment, many of them in common. And indeed, uh, these two subjects are the ones that did not survive the septic shock. So uh, there is some indication that we are grasping uh, meaningful information in, in this model. Here is another application. So this comes from the fMRI analysis. 
so the data that we had was uh, 20 subjects. Uh, after a redu reduction of the data, we had some 500 parcels and 94 time points. And this is the data that originally for Talma Hendra's labs, and we found uh, four or five core modules, depending on how we uh, define the parameters, but the, the content was very similar in both cases. So uh, the partition that uh, this, uh, these modules uh, give uh, of the brain makes sense to to our collaborator, the brain researcher, because they fit uh, uh, functional regions that are known to be related to rest. And interestingly, there were four subjects that had additional enrichment for a region of the brain that corresponds to attention, and the hypothesis that can be uh, that was made by our colleague was that there could be a subset of uh, the subject that at the time of rest, uh, they are more uh, distracted or attentive, if you wish, to the sensory stimuli uh, during this uh, rest uh, process. Uh, so this is part of the subject-specific information that we get. Now, uh, if we look at the uh, the different uh, subject, we see that, first of all, uh, the fraction of a shared parcel that are covered differs substantially among the uh, subjects. And also that the number of time points varies uh, substantially among the subjects. So we did n use this flexibility of the model, both in terms of uh, the core module definition and also in terms of the, uh, the time points involved. If we compare the two applications, these are, of course, completely different worlds and completely uh, uh, different data types. Uh, in gene expression, we notice that the, co the core modules are relatively small, uh, and there is a very large subject-specific part that is added in in this application. In contrast, in fMRI, the core modules were relatively large, uh, and there were smaller, more modest uh, uh, subject-specific uh, additions. Uh, and in both cases, the integration, uh, the way the model was defined, was crucial to, to obtain the results. Uh, and we find that we do find subject-specific information in each. Now, when we compared it to a variety of methods that were, did something similar to three-way analysis from the literature, uh, we see that uh, TWIGS uh, covers uh, the largest number of subjects compared to all the other methods and uh, substantial improvement. And also, if we try to use some a rank that summarizes both the enrichment and the redundancy, uh, Twig uh, fares better than the other methods. So it, it has some merits. So to summarize, uh, we came up with a probabilistic model for analyzing uh, three-dimensional data. And uh, one of the generalization of this model was allowing the core plus subject-specific uh, information, and another dimension was allowing the flexibility in the time dimension, the third dimension. We, de we developed a, a Bayesian model and a Gibbs sampling algorithm, and it should, performs better than the extant methods. Uh, interestingly, even when there's no added uh, information beyond the pure by clustering tasks. And uh, we do see a great improvement in terms of covering the subjects. And we applied it both to gene expression and to fMRI. And in both cases, we observed that the integrative analysis was uh, crucial to obtaining the results. We have an R implementation, and of course, this is a very first step, and there is lots of room to improve, both in terms of the 
way we define the priors, we use the most uh, simpler, uh, simplistic and uh, naive assumptions. Uh, there is no subject dependency in the parameter. Uh, one could apply this also to data there at work. There is no time dependency. And uh, uh, there are many ways to take this forward. And finally, let me thank uh, my group and my funding sources. Thank you very much. Questions? Mm -hmm. I really think this I think like for such a long time series they can visit the structure of MRI or the functional. Oh, this is functional MRI, and this is the normal size of uh, such studies. It's about a hundred time points. Yeah. Yeah, usually, I think people just set the correlation and then analyze. Yeah, the, the problem with correlation, this is what many people do. I think the most popular tool in this field is uh, ICA, Independent Component Analysis. But the problem is, as I said, that the correlation is not global, at least in REST studies. If you are doing what, what this uh, community calls a paradigm, so I don't know, you, you have a con specific trigger and then you tell people to raise their left hand or to count backward, then everything is synchronized. But we are dealing with completely in synchronized data because it's at rest and therefore correlation is problematic. It has to be global. It, it won't be global and its location will change. In a sense, it's similar to what you were describing. You have much, you need much more flexibility. Yes. Oh. If two objects have an influence on each other, so the signals generated by the objects follow each other with you know, small intervals, can this method be straightforward to generalize to that case? So you're talking about what type so of data? Object starts showing up, the next object starts showing up a little later, the next object starts showing up a little later, for example. So they trigger each other. Yeah, so I think in terms of the time series, you could define some, uh, something a bit more sophisticated than just Markovian dependency. So you could, if you know this dependency or you know the structure, you could tailor it into the model. Yeah. So was restitution ever like an obstacle? Because you have different subjects. Like how to register the brain, the MRI to like matrix or something. So what is the question? Registration. Was it ever um, a concern? What do you mean? Because I understand MRI for different individuals. It's kind of hard to map them to the same. Ah, okay. So this is, <clears throat> you're right. Every brain is different and we need to do this mapping. But there are standard uh, techniques. Uh, we didn't do anything special. We use the standard techniques that are doing this mapping. And of course, this is an added uh, source of noise, and this is one more reason <coughs> to work with parcels and not with voxels, because you're much more easily off on the level of this individual voxel. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.